Good evening, everyone. It's so great to see you. Welcome to Cities on a Plate. Please go ahead and continue to type in in the chat what city you're joining us from. Uh, we're in London today, the capital city of the United Kingdom. Um, the Cities on a Plate series was born out of a lot of quarantine cooking in 2020, um, where suddenly I was trying to mine childhood recipes and recreate dishes from the places in the world that I'd traveled to and lived in. So it's wonderful to be able to break bread again together uh, with you all, regardless of where in the world we are located. Uh, Toronto, Texas, Rhode Island, Hull in the UK. It's just so lovely to see everyone. We've even got Zimbabwe, great. Today, London on a Plate is all about exploring the delicious intersection between food and disciplines outside of the culinary arts. So we're hearing from Inesh Neto Dos Santos, a London-based visual artist and one third member of the Graham Ounce Collective. Then we are going to dip into the world of fashion with Kevin Jane, um, the brilliant designer and colorist who will be giving a demo on dyes from edible matter using things we might find in our kitchens like potato skins and turmeric. And finally, we'll venture into the tasty realm of gastrophysics with Professor Charles Spence from the University of Oxford, at which time um, you can have your dark chocolate uh, ready for our sonic seasoning experiment. As usual, we're keeping things nice and interactive. Uh, remember, as we go along, you can type in your questions and comments in the chat, which Steph will be facilitating for us today. And now, starting off um, on a deliciously artistic note, we have Inesh, who graduated with an MA from the Royal College of Art, uh, as an artist who works, as an artist myself, who works with edible sculptures and food performance. I was very excited to come across her work. Uh, Inesh, you're a visual artist who works across multiple disciplines. Um, take us through your practice and what draws you to food as a medium. Sure. Thank you, Lucia, for, um, for having me and for this wonderful invitation. I'm really excited to, to share this with you. Um, so, as uh, Lucia mentioned, hello everyone. My name is Inesh. I'm I'm an artist. I work with food mostly in in my practice. Um, I, I tend to say that I work with food, people, and and spaces um, as kind of three main um, things. Or yeah, that I, that I work with. And um, we can move on to the next slide, please. Um, I, in my work, I'm concerned with the socio-political impact of, of what we eat and, and how we come to eat it. Um, and through my practice, um, I create contexts or, or, or frameworks to investigate things like collaboration, togetherness, generosity, um, sustainability, um, all through, through the medium of food, which I've found to be um, one of the most successful mediums or, or spaces or tools to talk about things that often feel overwhelming or um, far away or difficult. Um, and, and through my work, I sort of tend to, to try and think how, how might we become um, a bit more aware and a bit closer to um, what are our intrinsic relationships to, to what surrounds us. Um, next slide, please. So I, I, in my practice, I cook, I teach, uh, and sometimes I write, and these are all things that inform my work in, in a variety of ways. Um, I've uh, worked um, for many years in hospitality, which has informed my, my art practice immensely. Um, I don't think it would be, I don't think my work would, would have been the same if I hadn't um, spent uh, so much time working in cafes and restaurants and and my work often exists in in the shape of um, installations performances or, or social sculptures and and it's generally um participatory um so there will 
generally always be an, an interaction um, and participation from, from the audience. Um, and next slide, please. As Lucia mentioned, um, I'm part of a, a collective called the Gramounts, uh, which I've joined quite recently. And I've um, today I've invited um, one of my partners at the Gramounts, Nora, Nora Silva, who's also an artist working with food. Um, and I wanted to invite Nora to um, tell us a little bit about, a few words about the Gramounts, um, as she is one of the founding members. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me and having the, us as the Grammounts. Um, so the Grammounts is a collective, um, we call ourselves food-based uh, art research collective. So what we do is we investigate things through food. And um, we, we have sort of three uh, ramifications at the moment. We run a course Currently, um, me and Inesh are, are, are doing it actually at the moment. It's called Food Cosmogonies. And we teach about the world through food in a, in a, number, of different, um, in a number of different ways and theories and philosophers, et cetera. Then we have um, our projects, which um, we develop um, uh, on different subjects or things we think are, are, are urgent or interesting. And then we have a supper club um, where we usually work with artists to develop uh, tasting menus based on the work shown um, in, an, in an exhibition. So the, the aim of the, of the supper club is to be able to make contemporary art more accessible for, the, for an audience um, through the means of being able to eat the show, basically, in, in, a, in, a, in a way. Um, and um, we were born uh, in 2014 as a way, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> as a way of sustaining our practices, but we very soon realized that um, it was not only a way of making money, but it was also a very interesting project to on its own to, to develop with art. Um, so um, yeah, we're really happy when, when Inesh accepted our marriage proposal. Um, so um, yeah, I think um, that's it. Is that, is that good Inesh? Do you want to add anything? Thank you, Nora. No, that's perfect. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited that I've recently joined the Grandmounts. Nora and I met when, when we were studying at RCA and we soon found out that we had lots in in common, lots of interests in common, and we collaborated and worked together on many occasions. And, and so joining the Gramounts felt like a natural um, step. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Nora. Um, Thank I love that aspect of, um, I love that aspect of, of, of teaching in your practice. Um, and uh, one of your latest classes was, or your most recent classes was about the potato as a migrant, right? One of the most adaptable Migrant. Yeah. Do you want to go in a little bit into that? Yeah, sure. So um, one of that's part of one of the lessons where we talk about food and empire. So we talk about food and colonization and race. And um, as an example, we use the potato um, as a, a vegetable that has its origins in the Andes in South America, but made it. Um, made it to Europe and to the rest of the world and, and managed to be part of most European countries' national dishes, for example, um, after a series of adaptations and, um, yeah, and migration. So the potato has a particular, uh, particularly interesting story in terms of uh, borders and, and uh, migration and all those very current themes. Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, the, the food cosmogonies course that, that Nora and I are, are running as part of the of the Grammounts is really a culmination of, of so many bits of research and interest that we've had in, in recent years. And so we're really happy to be able to put it together. And, and it, it runs across, um, in, in its current form, it runs across eight sessions, all exploring um, different things. And uh, we're now running the second iteration of it um until until july 
So really glad that we got to do that. It's sort of a dream job, we keep saying. <laughs> Indeed, wonderful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Nora. Um, so from there, um, I guess I'll, I'll take you a little bit into um, my practice and, and the topics and projects I've been focusing on. And fermentation has been a really big part of, of my work in, in recent years. I started working with fermentation in a really practical way. I, I was sort of working with food and making installations and performances and sort of ending up with lots of um, extra material, aka leftovers. And um, I stocked up my freezer, stocked up my friends' freezers and, and realized that, that there had to be another way. And also thinking about how my work was really ephemeral and perhaps how I could find ways of, of extending that ephemerality. So I looked at fermentation as a sort of really practical thing um, at first. And then suddenly, um, as I dug deeper into it, realized that fermentation is really an incredible metaphor and, and reference point for, for so many things that feel really urgent to talk about and really important, um, especially right now. And, and in fermentation, um, I started to see uh, a kind of beautiful and really hands-on metaphor for things like collaboration, uh, community, for democratic participation, and, and observing how a fermentation process is really a reflection of uh, its surrounding environment, of, of the surrounding fauna and flora, um, and, and sort of how it can be this gateway or this portal that can um, help us relate to what surrounds us, but also give us a wider understanding of how we are so enmeshed in, in, in our existence, not as a dominant species, but as a, a, a species that is, is part of this really um, wide network of, of beings and of, of different uh, scales of living. Uh, and so fermentation has, has been a very um, kind of important pillar in my practice to talk about all of these, all of these things. Um, next slide, please. And so talking about collaboration um, as, as one of these important um, ideas that I, that I work with, um, I wanted to share a project that I've been involved in, um, which opened and started in 2019 called Tender Touches, which is um, an artist run, it was an artist run cafe slash exhibition that I curated with curator Huma Kabachi, who runs, um, a platform called Open Space. Open Space is a platform that supports uh, emerging artists uh, and is sort of a nomadic um, arts platform currently based in London, uh, sometimes in Istanbul. And so together we, I came together with Huma and we um, created this um, exhibition which existed as a fully functioning cafe and everything in it was made by artists, all the crockery, uh, the cutlery, uh, the furniture, artworks on the walls. And the, the primary idea was um, a little bit like what, what Nora mentioned, was to try and find ways, uh, kind of access points into um, an art space, an exhibition space, and, and tr trying to consider and question what, what does it mean to engage with art and, and, and who is allowed to do that or, or who feels comfortable to do that. And so suddenly, um, we created this space of a, of a cafe where visitors could come in and sit down and, and we'd offer everyone uh, a cup of coffee uh, on the house to, to, to start off. And then there, were, there, there was food available on the menu, um, which uh, I made and created in response to all the artworks in, in the show and all the artists that were part of it through conversations with them. Um, and, and really it was a sort of way of, of presenting this really familiar space of a cafe, of a restaurant, uh, and, and putting it into a gallery in, in order to, to sort of open up um, the space and, and the idea of an exhibition to perhaps um, audiences that might not engage with it generally. Um, next slide, please. We uh, ran a series of workshops and performances like dinners, supper clubs. Um, I ran a few fermentation workshops. And so visitors kind of came and went. Sometimes uh, we had a few regulars. This happened over the course of um, six weeks, if I remember correctly. 
And so uh, the space became really lively and changed over the course of time with, with its usage. Um, and in the end, we sort of really questioned what, um, what is an artwork and what does it mean if I can touch an artwork and, and, and you know, put it in my mouth or, or, or sit on it or, or lean on it or hold it in my hands. Um, so this was a really important project um, for me in my practice and probably one of the most ambitious ones that I've been involved in. And it was, it was a culminating of, of so many things and, and so many strands of, of uh, thinking and research that I've been doing. So it was really exciting to be able to, to, to be there. I was, I was able to luckily be present in the space every day and cooking every day, meeting uh, visitors, which um, felt really special and, and really important. Um, next slide, please. We have recently launched a book, which is uh, which kind of came out of the exhibition, um, and this book uh, sort of holds um, all of the, or not all, but a few of the recipes that I came up came up with for for the exhibition, particularly recipes that were connected with the artists in the show. So those recipes came out of conversations with the art with the other artists or. Um, just observations of their work um, and kind of serve as, as, an, as a reading of those conversations or, or those artworks. And the book includes those recipes and includes also essays by um, a few of the artists that were part of the show. Um, it includes a dried um, kombucha scoby, which uh, anyone who gets the book gets, gets one and, and gets to rehydrate it to, to make their own kombucha. Um, and, and a few new artworks that were commissioned, especially for the book. Uh, and the, the book is available for sale on, on uh, the Open Space website. And I think that link will, will be shared um, yes. with you all sometime soon. Yes, um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited that we got to make this book because it, it felt sort of like a coming together of, of many things that um, happened and came up during the exhibition. Uh, that we sort of didn't manage to fully communicate at the time, but were able to, to put together into the book. Um, next slide, please. And so um, just to, to end my, my presentation, I'll tell you about another project that is, has been really important for me, um, which I uh, carried out in the Azores as part of a, an arts festival called Walk and Talk, which happens every year. Um, in the Azores. And, and the Azores are a group of islands uh, in the Atlantic, which um, are part of Portugal, and they sit on the um, kind of connection or the, the meeting point of two tectonic plates. And so they, they're in this point in, 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 uh, um, in the planet where it, it means that the, the climate in these islands is really tropical and um, also they're volcanic islands. So there's this amazing um, energy being, being that you feel when you're in these islands and, and nature there is sort of incredible and big and sort of green, super green everywhere. And so I, I was invited to be, to be part of this um, festival uh, by a group called the Decorators who were curating a part of it. And they were working on um, a part of the festival called Expedition Empathy. Um, and the idea for Ex Expedition Empathy was to, um, kind of contrary to uh, many expeditions done um, on, in these islands in the 16th century, where the point was to um, make very um, specific, very science-led observations of landscape, very human-centric observations of landscape and recordings of landscape and, and species. Um, it, was, it was about sort of getting to know these, these spaces and these places through, um, other senses through this idea of empathy, this idea of an approximation to, to our surroundings that isn't necessary, necessarily mathematical or, or measurable. Um, and so I started by kind of bringing my um, ideas around fermentation. I, I started um, my proposal to the festival with a performance, which is what you see on the screen. This is a screenshot from the performance where I walked around the, the one of the islands, San Miguel, with my sourdough starter, which by this point had traveled across many countries and had become one with other starters and had been mixed with um, flowers from lots of different places. And so I did this symbolic walk with it in, in a jar that was hanging around my body. 
um, as sort of an introduction of these microbes that I was carrying in this blob of flower and water to the microbes of this landscape as a sort of um, moment of, of greeting and of meeting. Um, next slide, please. I spent a week uh, in the Azores, which felt really short and I really want to go back because it's, a, it's an incredible uh, place. And so throughout this week, I met local people who um, took me foraging uh, with whom I learned about this, very, this local technique of cooking underground, uh, the Azores being, and, and San Miguel being a, a volcanic island. The ground uh, has this amazing um, capacity uh, for, for, well, it is, is hot, is really hot. And so there's this tradition of um, digging holes in the ground and cooking, um, usually a sort of really big pot of a layered meaty stew with vegetables. Um, and so I was trying to sort of think about collaborations with this, with this island, with all of these other species of, from the tiniest microbe to the tallest tree. Um, and so I ended up presenting um, this performative meal where everything that was on the table was um, cooked, sometimes not even cooked, I guess fermentation is a, is a way of cooking. Um, in a collaboration with, with all of these other species and elements. So um, I learned about this technique of cooking underground. And so in a collaboration with a local chef, um, we developed a recipe to cook bread um, underground. And so I was also foraging. So collected all these herbs and, and fruits, which were fermented. Um, in the Azores, amazing tropical things like uh, pineapple and passion fruit grow really abundantly. So we fermented those into drinks. Um, next slide, please. And so this uh, meal was presented on a table designed by the decorators, which was, um, I think, a 20 meter long table that sat around 100 people. And on, on one end, it had a hole. And this hole sat right above uh, one of the holes in the ground where this uh, bread that um, I developed with the local chef was, was cooking. And so the ground gets really hot. It, it gets up to about 200, 250 degrees Celsius. And um, it's a very humid heat. So what comes out is a sort of cakey bread. Um, I, I had found this old um, Icelandic recipe for a bread that is also cooked underground there and adapted it to the local landscape um, and it, it was in the ground cooking for about 10 hours before we collectively uh, through a pulley system that was installed as part of the table we collectively um, pulled it out of the ground as you see in the pictures and sort of unveiled it and had it um, as, as part of this meal together with all of these fermented fruits and vegetables and herbs um, and seaweed. Uh, there was also um, cheese that had been drying and kind of um, curing uh, whilst I was there. So this was really um, a project that was about kind of trying to understand this, this landscape and this space that I, I suddenly found myself in um, through things that, that, were, that went beyond just looking or trying to write about it or trying to read these very um, uh, kind of straightforward descriptions of a landscape. It was about trying to connect and, and understand this, this place through these relationships with beings of many scales uh, and, and activities of many scales. And so um, it was, I, it was it's, it stands to date one of my favorite uh, projects and I hope that I, I get to go back soon um, to continue fantastic. this research. What was people's reaction like to the, the bread um, I think it was a surprise because often, bread isn't often cooked in these uh, in these holes in the ground. Is generally people come to eat the stew, and so um, I, I think also that the the collective action of pulling the pots was and, and then opening them and eating it was very um, satisfying in a way <laughs> for everyone to sort of have this work. And and we almost sang as kind of very improvised improvised sang a song of, of pulling the, to, to get it to give us the rhythm to pull the pots out of the ground so it became this really kind of collective action um and Definitely. i think it was people were surprised but um also curious and and kind of intrigued that how all of this had happened <laughs> 
I love how, um, for example, with your kombucha, the, um, the, the fermented tea becomes a site itself, an archive, as you describe in your work. Um, so I love how it's, it's a food as a medium, but it's also very much part of the content of what you are um, relating to people. Yeah, I think um, for me, that's sort of inescapable. Um, I'm, I, I cannot, uh, and, and actually do not want to separate um, food as a material from, from food as a, as a subject or as a, or as a, a topic. Um, it's, it's very, very rich and wide. And I think there's so much to explore in that. Um, that and I think even the all of the all of these ideas and concepts that are tied up with food are often more easily or, or perhaps only understandable when you really are there with your hands on either making something or eating it or tasting it. Um, right. The entry point. That's fantastic. Any questions, Steph, from the chat? Nothing in the chat. I'm curious, Inesh, what's your next in like a slowly reopening world? What would be the next project that you'd be the most excited to take on? Well, um, I've been very lucky to have been doing a residency in, in Lisbon, uh, which is not where I'm usually living right now. It's just ended today in a, in a real space with real people <laughs> um, in, in a theater with a big performance group. Um, and that's just finished. But I'm very excited to return to Lisbon in August um, to start making a film about beans, which is another strand of my research that I've been kind of pulling out, um, looking at beans and the way that beans grow and the way that they behave underneath the soil as as a metaphor, as a reference point to, to how we might, um, again, engage uh, in, in, with our surroundings and become more aware of, of our role in, in this very enmeshed existence. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Anish and, and Nora, um, for enlightening us on, on your practice. Um, now, you. here's a fun backstory uh, to our next um, speaker. I was first introduced uh, to Kevin a couple of years ago, actually, when I was in London doing research for my slow fashion cookbook um, for the British Council, which was all about profiling um, young designers who are cooking up a storm in sustainable fashion. Uh, so during my time there, Kevin and I couldn't actually connect in person, but uh, so it was really exciting to be able to pick up that thread for, for London on a plate. Um, Kevin Jane is both a designer and a colorist. She graduated with a master's degree in women's wear knit from the Royal College of Art. Um, you may have even seen her stunning collection at the London Fashion Week designer showrooms in 2018. Um, so to start off with Kevin, tell us a bit about your journey with color. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, like um, Inesh, I also went to Royal College of Art and that's where my kind of introduction or my investigation into natural colour began. Um, studying fashion, um, primarily it was about, you know, design, design of the garments. Um, but for me, I was really interested in um, kind of earth conscious design and fashion and especially um you know within that is you know transparency of the the supply chain so i kind of started my investigation at the time into um the origin of fiber so i was looking at um you know the um mainly cotton you know the fields where they were grown who were growing you know the buds what pesticides were used every single detail of um you know the growth of that fiber so once i managed to kind of pin down um fully transparent and ethical sources for my fibers that i was using i realized that you know it was a bit contradictive to base my practice around transparency and origin when I didn't really know the origin of the colors that I was applying to the textiles. So that's really was the start of my kind of investigation into natural color. Um, I suppose 
Uh, natural colour comes in a lot of different um, forms. So at the moment, we've seen a kind of um, kind of big, big rise in bacterial colour. So um, either genetically modified or not, but growing colour in labs. Um, then we've got kind of the most primitive forms of colour, which kind of go from mineral a mineral colour to um, you know plant a plant based colour and also um, food. So yeah, I'm gonna. I'm, I mean, I could go on forever about the different kind of forms of colour, but I'm gonna obviously base my demo today on um, right. kind of edible colour. And um, what are you yeah, doing I, I think today? That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll jump. I think I'll jump straight in with. Um, with the demo because it's I want to be really practical and just kind of explain um, working with natural color is very different to working with synthetic there's a lot of different processes you need to prepare the fiber to take in the dye so that usually means it's a kind of extra step and it's called mordanting so at the moment I have um, different fibers so different fibers kind of react and work um, differently with all different plant matter. And that's because you get cellulose fibers, which are kind of plant-based. So that would be like cotton, linen, hemp, uh, viscose, and then you get protein fibers. So that would be kind of animal derived. So silk, um, wool. So you have to treat them quite differently. Um, so usually how I would prepare the fabric is by mordanting. Um, so that's really, you kind of simmer, simmer your fabric in a solution for six, up to 60 minutes to kind of usually overnight, I would leave them. And primarily I would use alum. So potassium alum, um, it's not edible as far as I know. I know that it is in, in kind of deodorant and a few different kind of cosmetics, but I probably wouldn't recommend um, eating it, but you do get edible um, mordants such as um, soy milk. So soy milk is really, really great on cellulose fibers because it's um, instead of a mordant, it's more of a binder. So it will kind of teach the, the fibers to act more like protein fibers because protein fibers and natural dye are kind of a match made in heaven. They work really, really well together. So soy milk is great. And also um, rhubarb leaves. Um, rhubarb leaves, I believe are, not edible um oh, but yes. you can don't eat <laughs> <laughs> no 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 um but they are a kind of um a natural plant-based way of mordanting fabric um and then also some dye stuff you don't need to mordant at all and that's what i'm kind of going to base a lot of my demo on today so the the three colors that i'm going to to show you do not need um the fabric to be pre-mordanted um so I'm going to start. Okay, so, so the first one, um, I'm just going to, it's quite hot, is pomegranate. So you can see mm. here, I'm just going to, so it's super, super simple um, to kind of do this in your kitchen. So you're just going to get your, your fabric and make sure your fabric is kind of um, wetted. So I would leave it about 60 minutes just in fiber so it's completely weighted throughout and then you're also um for the pomegranate it's going to just really you know chop it just any old way I'm really not precious when I'm preparing the the food you know to go in the dye bath and um, so yeah you really you would just spoon out all the kind of um the inner seeds of the pomegranate and you would just want to concentrate on the rind so it's the pomegranate rind you know the skin that gives the color the reason that you don't need to mordant your fabric is because pomegranate skin is really really rich in tannin um, and tannin is a compound that basically opens the fibers to let the color in so the color is really strong and it will also stay color fast for longer so it's like a nature's great way of allowing color to, to fix on. So you can see here that I've had these skins in this kind of dye bath for about 60 minutes. You can dry them out and kind of use them whenever you want. You don't have to use them fresh. Um, I just use these fresh and they've been about 
they've actually been about two hours in the dye bath. And you can see straight away that I've kind of left a little bit of fabric in for the past two hours, just to see how strong the color can go. So you can see that's a really lovely oh, wow. um, yellow. So, and that's without any um, assists. So I'll talk about assists in a little minute. Um, that's really just a kind of um, Dyer's language for adding different solutions that can change the color and tone um, of, of the dye pot. So that's the really exciting, it's probably the, the part of natural dye that I am most excited about um, is you're able to actually shift uh, the color of the dye bath by changing the pH. And I'm gonna go into a bit more detail about that in a second. So this one that you can see um, is avocado seeds. Now that I'm just holding is a, a full avocado seed. I don't chop it. I don't usually even rinse it. I just chuck it in with water, bring it to the boil and simmer for about 60 minutes. This is about two hours. So the longer that you simmer, um, you know, the more color will be extracted from, from the seed. Um, you can also leave them overnight. So you can simmer for 60 minutes and then kind of leave them in the bath overnight. And that is and how much three, about how much water would you do for us for a single seed? Um, so again, I'm really unprecious when the more you I've, I've been natural dying for about five years now, and the more you kind of get deeper into it, I think the less methodical and precious you become, because okay. they kind of have a life of their own. So I would really say okay. just get stuck in and try that's I would probably say one seed, I would give like a cup to two cups of water um, just because I like okay. the color quite strong as well. Um, okay. But, you know, have a play around because you can get some really nice shades, um, you know, just by using a lot less dye matter. Right. So you can see here, that's oh. a bit of wool that I've left in. And you can see that that's came up a really gorgeous kind of red pink color. Oh, wow. The colors yeah. too that one gets from the different materials are sort of not what one would instinctively think of, right? Yes, exactly. And things. that's the kind of interesting kind of experimental part. And when you go into the world of shifting the, the pH, so adding alkaline or acidic uh, solutions, that will completely change the color. So I'll show you that in a second. And then this here, so this is red cabbage. So I have literally just chopped it up any old way. I'm not too precious about the size, just as long as they kind of sit, you know, quite nicely in your dye bath. So here you can see you've got, this is the parts of cabbage and it's went really, really dark because I've used quite a lot of um, cabbage in there, but you can see it's hard to tell, but this is actually my piece of wool. So you can see oh. how dark that has actually become. And you can't really oh, see wow. too well, but it's kind of a really deep aubergine kind of color. Okay. And, and also- so That's a purple cabbage. If, if one uses a regular, oh, not a regular cabbage, but a sort of green and white one, do you get any sort of color from that or no? It has no, to be you won't get any color extraction from a white cabbage, no. Okay. Unfortunately not. You can use, however, um, it's quite an interesting comparison, a, a red onion and a white onion, because you will actually get colour from both. So I'm not going to show you in a demo how to do it, but it's very self-explanatory. The same method as the other dyes, but you just use the skin. Um, so with food matter, it's mainly the, the skins or this, the inner seed that will give the most colour. So with onion, you'll get like a nice kind of um, dark brown, almost lilac with the, the red onion skin. And then the white onion, you'll get like a nice beige brown with that as well. So, so now I'm just gonna show you quickly how you can um, change the shade of the dye stuff by shifting the pH. And I'm gonna do that okay. with um, vinegar and lemon. So they're the obviously acidic solutions. And then I've got, um, I usually use iron, which is um, ferrous sulfate, which is not edible, 
but you can use things like bicarbonate of soda um, kind of in, in its um, position. So, so I've got some bicarbonate soda, literally just mixed it with some hot water and then some vinegar. And is it again, just a couple of teaspoons for all of us yes. novices starting out? <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. I mean, measurements. For the vinegar, I'm just gonna paint it onto the sample. So I've just got okay. like almost like a teaspoonful. Bicarbonate, um, I would use about a teaspoonful as well. Um, and that's, I'd say like about five, six um, tablespoonfuls. And then I'm also going to use a bit of iron as well, um, just so you can, it really shows how drastic the, the colour change can be, but um, it's not obviously edible. Um, and just to let you, give you an idea of how the iron comes, I buy it like this, but you can kind of leave rusting metal in some water overnight and that will give you kind of like a homemade iron um, solution. Oh, great. So, I'm gonna Kevin, we have a question from Maka, which was, how long does the dye keep? And have you tried dyeing other materials like plastic versus just fabric? Yes, so good question. So natural dye genuinely does not uh, work on synthetics. Um, the nature of synthetics, um, it just doesn't open up to take in the, the dye. Um, indigo, however, indigo is a very different natural dye. Um, I actually didn't realise that indigo was edible until recently because I've been working at this amazing allotment um, up in North London and we are um, growing indigo plants. So it's uh, indigo ferra tinctoria is the, the plant that the pigment is extracted from. And there's about over 850 species um, of indigo and wood. So we are growing two types of Japanese um, species and a type of wood. And we actually, um, um, so with indigo, it, you know, it almost, you can't master it in a lifetime. It almost, you know, is never masterable. But I have um, two amazing mentors that studied in Japan from an indigo master and they're um, leading on the, the indigo um, dye garden. And they actually brought in some dried indigo leaves for us to have indigo tea the last time that we were there so um oh, wow so, yeah so i believe some species of indigo leaves are actually you know edible it tasted lovely it was quite it was very kind of musky and earthy but it was lovely and then let's say that i decided to like save some of my red onion to attempt <laughs> dying for so for our viewers can i just boil that in water and it'll come out and then how long could i keep that dye that's extracted from the red onion um so get as much skins as you can simmer them for about 60 minutes um, and then that should be enough time to add your fabric i wouldn't use the, the same dye bath for more than a few days because it will start to, um, the, you won't be able to extract really any more color. And the more fabric that you color from it, that'll soak up the pigments. So really eventually you won't, you won't be extracting any color at all, but a few days I would keep. There's other plant matter that I use that isn't edible that I keep for a while. Um, but that's, you know, very different from, from edibles. So pH, um, I'm going to take some bicarbonate and I'm just going to take my sample that I've done with the, the red cabbage and I'm just going to start to paint on Ah, okay, so you can see here that there's not really been any change at the moment. So then I'm going to take some vinegar. And I'm going to apply the vinegar in the middle. And you can see that really the vinegar is also not shifting this at all. 
And then I'm also going to take some lemon to try lemon. So I use this as kind of a, an investigation um, journey. It's really interesting to see what food will actually shift with pH and what food won't. And I'm just going to put the lemon straight on like this. And actually, you can create um, a print with this method as well. So you can see now that the lemon is really the only one that has changed it. I don't know if you can see that well, but it's actually now starting to turn pink. Oh, yes. Don't, I'm trying to get the light right so you can see. Yeah, I do see that bit of pink. It's amazing what a kind of painterly process it is as well, using the paintbrushes too. And I'll leave it to oxidize because the more that the oxygen is allowed into the fibers, the more that the color will become a bit clearer. Okay, and then I'm going to get my other sample of the avocado seed. And again, uh, this time I'm going to try some, um, some iron solution. And I'm just going to oh. run the iron solution over. And you can see already that that's becoming almost the dark aubergine that we got from the red cabbage. Right. So that one you can see a bit better with the lighting, but it goes a lot, lot, you know, the color shifts to, um, to an alkaline solution. You can also, um, you can get these actually in pharmacies. They're little papers where you can test the, the pH. So if you're, you kind of are more interested in knowing the pH of each solution, um, in order to what, what to add to make it a colour that you might want it to go. You can kind of monitor. I wouldn't say it's very predictable or accurate because with natural dyes, it's always a bit of a gamble. But, you know, these are great if you want to do a kind of log of, of pH. So you can see there, it just continues to get darker. So if you were to add um, kind of iron solution to a, a bath of avocado seed, you would then have the whole cloth in this dark aubergine color. So it's really interesting how with one dye stuff, you can get a whole shade of, of colors. Right. How has the, in the, in the time that you've been working with natural color, how has the perception of natural color evolved through your, um, I know you do a lot of workshops. Yeah, so I done one um, for Nike last year, and that was great because Nike um, are obviously a huge um, fashion brand, sports brand. So it was really great for them to, you know, take interest to educate themselves and their staff um, on on natural dye. But there are, you know, natural dye is, is the most primitive way of of adding color to textiles. So in India, because of the the climate. They have lots of natural dye houses over there that can do quite high production volume just because, um, you know, they can grow a lot of dye plants there. Um, Italy are now, um, I kind of consult for one mill over there that are 100% um, natural dye process. And I'm now going to be working on some projects coming up this year um, to introduce that into dye houses in, in the UK as well. So. So hopefully Fantastic. we'll be able to do it here. And then again, pomegranate. And I'm just gonna see if this will be affected. No. Nope. And then I'm gonna put, ah yeah, so you can see the red cabbage is almost like a, a kind of rainbow now, the more that the oxygen It's also great to do if you have kids and um, these kind of exercises because it really you know it just lets them opens their eyes to the origin of color 
And then vinegar, I'm gonna try on the... There's a question about how long natural dyes will last if a garment has to be washed. Was there a special ingredient? I think you did touch briefly on to, to fix the color. Yeah, yeah, of course. So that's um, a bit of a tricky one with natural dyes. The reason that pomegranate and avocado seeds are really good for color fastness is because they are rich in tannin. So, you know, you'd have to still wash them on um, basically a lukewarm hand wash. Um, but, you know, the anything that would contain tannin, and you can look that up on the internet as well to see to see if it does. Anything that does will, will be quite good colour fast. It won't be as good as synthetic. Um, but I, you know, in my practice, I feel like, you know, the beauty is how the colour evolves. And I know that's not the consensus of industry kind of practice, but I, I hope to see that in the future that consumers might learn or, you know, might be able to see the beauty in, you know, natural, you know, the natural evolution of the garment. Oh, that's fantastic. And then you can see adding the iron solution to the pomegranate, it's going darker at the, the end as well. Oh, fantastic. And then just to pick up, so this is now going completely pink, the, the red cabbage. Oh, great. Oh, thank you, Kevin, for that wonderful demo. We're certainly not going to look at um, red cabbage in the same way. Um, yeah. Um, just um, before I finish, sorry, just um, so these two oh. dyes obviously are very pH sensitive, but there are a lot of other dyes like um, black bean water, um, stinging nettles, um, seaweed you can extract colour from, turmeric is great as well. Um, so, yeah, there's... Um, once you research, there's a lot of, of food that can give, give great colour. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank um, you. And so now we're going from, in a way, we're going from cabbage to cocoa. So have your dark, um, have your dark chocolate on standby. Because we're diving into the world of gastrophysics, which actually isn't at all as alien as it may sound. Um, but we do have the world's leading expert on the topic uh, today, Professor Charles Spence from the University of Oxford, um, who's also the author of the delightful book, Gastrophysics, the New Science of Eating. Um, Professor Spence also won, uh, I, I really enjoyed reading it, uh, Professor Spence also won the Ig Nobel Prize for Nutrition in 2008, which is awarded to science that first makes people laugh and then makes them think. Um, so now gastro and physics aren't two words that uh, we mere mortals would normally put together. Um, uh, Professor Spence, what exactly is gastrophysics? So I describe it as a new science of eating. Uh, the two words that kind of get squished together and deformed a little bit in the process of coming up with gastrophysics are gastronomy on the one hand, so nice food experiences, which probably hopefully uh, everyone out there is uh, um, uh, familiar with. And the other part is not physics per se, but gas, uh, sorry, psychophysics, which is kind of a part of psychology, uh, normally applied to seeing and hearing, where you try and uh, present lots of things to people and see how they respond. Um, it's a kind of a scientific approach to perception. Uh, and in gastrophysics, I try and take that approach and apply it to the world of uh, food and drink to try and figure out how, what we see, everything from the colors we we're just hearing about, the edible ones at least, uh, through what we hear, feel, smell and taste can influence the um, experience of uh, dining. Working a lot with chefs um, around the world, but given my normal basis in Oxford, uh, working a lot with chefs like Heston Blumenthal from the Fat Duck, which I guess we could kind of call Greater London, I suppose, almost just about. Uh, and in recent years, uh, been working closely with um, a young chef by the name of Joseph Youssef of Kitchen Theory, who has been popping up around London from Maida Hill Place for a few years to, to the House of Wolf in Islington, to his current um, permanent abode in uh, High Barnet, where he has a uh, 
uh, a kitchen studio um, and where he was pre-COVID and I think just about in the coming weeks starting again to run a gastrophysics chef's table um, menu to sort of illustrate some of the science of the senses and how it affects what we uh, taste, what we enjoy. Um, and also at the same time, sometimes to, to, to uh, collect data from diners as they eat about some of the factors that we might uh, manipulate. I guess kind of the question is, you know, why bother? Why do we need a new science of eating? Um, given that so much food is so delicious already. Uh, and for me, I, I sort of think that we've had, you know, two decades or so of, of molecular gastronomy, of modernist cuisine, um, all science in the kitchen, the science of spumes and foams and gels and rotavaps and anti-griddles, the science, you know, of, of ingredients and of cooking techniques. Uh, but no one's really been applying the science of psychology, but also anthropology and uh, behavioral economics to, to the dining room and to the mind of the person who's doing the tasting. And for me, that's, you know, that's where we experience flavors. Uh, the good ones and the horrible ones are all in our minds, not in our mouth, because um, it's in our brains where the sight of food, its color, automatically sets expectations about what we're about to taste. Uh, the sounds that we hear affect us, the chair we're sitting on, kind of all the senses, both in the food and the environment, uh, come together for the first time in our brains, along with our mood and our emotions, our levels of stress because of COVID and so on. It all comes together here first. And it's kind of one of the amazing things that our brains can do is to convince us that we're really tasting in our mouth when in fact, it's all, all the clever stuff is happening up above. Um, for that reason, you know, if, if, if you know, the pleasures of the table, as I write in the book, are primarily in the mind, not in the mouth, then that kind of means we need to rethink, I think, uh, how we present and prepare and enjoy food. Uh, suggest that it's you know, traditional notions of the, of the, of the, of the uh, palate cleanser, that acidic sorbet you might have eaten in a fancy restaurant to clear your palate before food is kind of, to me, irrelevant. And what you really need is a mental palate cleanser something that gets your mind into the right state, uh, lifts your mood uh, prior to eating, because that's probably going to have a bigger impact than um, anything you do to the taste buds themselves. That's incredible. Uh, so everything off the plate is just as important as what we're eating and actually influences what we're going to be experiencing. It's amazing. And in a way that you know, most of us don't realise, because we all, I think, feel like we can just taste what's in our mouth, and none of us think that we would be fooled or influenced or tricked by changing the weight of the cup or the weight of the cutlery or the uh, eye appeal of the food in terms of gastroporn or that or the pitch of the music in the background but all of these things do many of them do influence our um, taste experience and, uh, and in my work that I'm not a chef uh, nor a creative nor an artist or a designer but sort of work with the creatives of the kitchen chefs like uh, Joseph Husser but also with culinary artists like um, uh, Caroline Hopkinson and, uh, and Bompus and Parr, if we can still call them that, uh, to uh, illustrate some of the, the science of the senses, because in a way, just talking about it doesn't convince anybody of anything if that's not how it feels to us. And so most of it feels like we can just taste the drink in a glass. And it's been through collaborations with chefs like um, uh, Hassan Blumenthal with the sound of the sea dish, from 15 years ago now almost, where we could enhance the taste of seafood by playing the sounds of the sea. Um, kind of a dish that then brings some people to tears in Slough. Um, something that rarely happens oh, wow. with the seafood. You know, when was the last yeah. time you cried over a fish or a bit of sashimi? Uh, probably never. Um, and yet when it's combined with technology, with sound, it can transform the experience and. We did the experiment with the chef here in, well, there in Oxford back in uh, 2007, feeding people oysters, playing the sounds of the sea, playing the sounds of farmyard chickens. And those who ate their oysters with the sounds of the sea said the oysters tasted significantly better, but no more um, salty. That led in then to the sound of the sea dish at the Fat Duck restaurant. And thereafter with Chef Joseph, we've been sort of taking that idea that what we hear can change what we taste and what we think about what we taste in some other directions, Chef Joseph is one 
I guess, of a growing number of younger chefs who are really interested in sustainability and not just feeding the palate of those who dine, but also a bit of edutainment, if you will. Um, and uh, so he's taken the sort of sound of the sea idea and on his gastrophysics chef's table in High Barnet, um, the first course you will get when you sit at the main table uh, is jellyfish. Like a, you know, what, a jellyfish, something that most Western diners don't like the idea of because it sounds jelly-ish. When in fact, when it's treated, uh, it's kind of just crunch, it's pure texture in food. Uh, and as global warming continues apace, our oceans are getting fuller and fuller of jellyfish. So somebody's got to do something with them um, as they block up power stations and this, that, and the other. Uh, and the idea is to kind of adapt, adopt uh, from the Far East, places like Japan, where jellyfish is quite a, you know, a desirable food item. And Chef Joseph in his restaurant in High Barnet is trying to curate that first experience of jellyfish for many Western diners by using projection mapping of the sea over the table by delivering a delicious tasting jellyfish dish with cucumber gazpacho but at the same time diners wear a pair of headphones um, and that plays both the sounds of the waves where the jellyfish might have been floating before they made their way to your um, uh, plate but also periodically embedded in there are sounds of crunch of somebody crunching on crisps kind of on the one hand referencing the Ig Nobel Prize for nutrition for the sonic chip we did years ago but what's sort of amazing is how then when you're eating this dish in high barnet sometimes you crunch but the headphones don't crunch sometimes the headphones crunching but you're not crunching uh, and sometimes they kind of synchronize and your brain is kind of drawn into this thing of was that my crunch or the headphones crunching and sometimes it integrates sometimes it kind of segregates in the way that some uh artists like bruce nauman like, with, with lip sync have played with effectively before it sort of captures in the table and, and then as you kind of go through the dishes then that um chef joseph uh, and i have worked on together uh they've got a lot of very often use sound both the kind of the, the environmental sounds the sounds of nature that you sort of bring into the restaurant the sounds of the sea um but we've also brought in the sounds of uh uh, of the ducks and one of the most fun dishes that we served in the Andaz Hotel in London for 100 diners back in 2016, sits over Liverpool Street Station and they served them a, a duck dish, the only um, uh, meat animal protein on a nine course tasting menu. Again, trying to nudge the diners away from animal protein, but not doing it because we tell diners they should or it's good for them or good for the planet, but doing it in sort of a fun way through their taste buds then this duck dish comes to the table but before it does so the chef comes out and says um now it's got to go and get your dinner got to catch your duck and as he departs back into the kitchen uh you hear over the loudspeakers the sound of a duck going, whack, 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 and then a, as a uh cleaver comes down on we imagine the neck of the duck and silence oh no uh, and then the duck the, the duck dish comes back out pr fully prepared looking beautiful and in this case, it's kind of like a, a riff on the sound of the sea. It's not all of the sounds of nature or of animals or things that would necessarily enhance the taste. But that's kind of the point to have diners kind of giggling a bit, sort of uncomfortable. But the chef's point there is, you know, you know if you don't want to know where your animal protein came from, why are you eating it? Uh, and maybe through this sort of playful bit of almost sonic seasoning, it might be possible to kind of nudge diners away from, away from, uh, traditional foods, uh, but lure them in through their taste buds, be it jellyfish, be it um, entomophagy with insects. We've done a few dining concepts there, um, mm. or through to our, our sort of current work on, on thinking about taking the gastrophysics, the science of dining, and thinking, can we deliver to diners uh, an experience that goes beyond anything they've had before? Um, and that might be extraordinary in some way. So can we deliver edible magic is one of our current themes in the restaurant. Um, and the chef has this wonderful dish of, of, of light bulbs that you can illuminate and then he can drop the light bulbs on the table. They smash the glass everywhere. And then he encourages you to eat that glass, which is really just spun sugar. Um, and uh, that's kind of magical. And we've been working with 
ASMR, these kind of strange neck shivers some people get. When we whisper, it'll crinkle paper. Um, whole online community of ASMRs, autonomous sensory meridian response. And we've been working to make that sort of pleasurable neck shiver that some people get, tie it to, to food. Um, and in our, uh, I didn't think there was some mention of chocolate somewhere, wasn't there, a moment ago? Uh, in, yeah. in, uh, in, in one of the main themes, we've kind of gone beyond the sounds of nature, be it the sounds of the sea with, with Heston Blumenthal, or, or, or the sounds of the ducks dying moments uh, with Chef Joseph, um, to think about other ways that sound may affect us. And that's an area that we sort of call sonic seasoning, which is where we can take music to season and change the taste of the food that we eat. Um, and this is something that you know, we first did in London in 2012 with a culinary artist, um, food artist, Caroline Hopkinson with the uh, Fat Duck Research Kitchens with Condiment Junkie, a sound design agency, or as like a pop-up dining experience in the House of Wolf, as was. Um, served there as a, a bitter sweet chocolate lolly uh, and diners in the restaurant in this five cents tasting menu uh, could take out their mobile technology and dial one of two telephone numbers to hear bitter music or to hear sweet music. Um, and that music we had developed uh, to bring out sweetness or bitterness on the palate. Now that was 2012, the first example of sonic seasoning, I think, in a restaurant anywhere in the world. And we've been working on this ever since with chefs and designers and composers and musicians and marketeers and all sorts. Uh, and I have for you today uh, two of our latest examples of sonic seasoning that were actually created by a student working on a TV show, uh, but which worked very effectively for us. Um, so before you taste your chocolate, I'm just going to get you to listen to these two, about five seconds of each of these tracks, and just think which of the two tracks you would say sounds more bitter, and which track do you think sounds sweeter? Off we go. Great. Test track one. This is track two. Yeah. You add in the um, chat, what do you think? Which, which track one, is it bitter or sweet? Uh, I am going to go with track one being bitter. Now, the, oh, there are no right or wrong answers here, because tastes don't literally have a sound. And yet there is a consensual answer that, that, that the majority of people that may agree upon. Um, I think, yep, it's got to be bitter, 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 bitter. No, it won't end up being sweet. It's definitely bitter, definitely bitter, I think. Um, and now, uh, having sort of coded those bits of music, if you can call them music, as, as, as sonic seasoning, bitter and sweet, if you now try taking a bite of your piece of dark chocolate, which you hopefully have at home, and the same moment we'll play 10 seconds of track number one and see what your taste experience is like. see if the taste experience changes with track two. Okay. Um, no way. This doesn't... <laughs> so hopefully on 16 out of 17, we tried this on a, on a, on a TV show a few months ago, last year, I guess now. Uh, rated that first, when they were tasting a chocolate with the first soundscape is more bitter, sort of brings out the bass notes, whereas with the second track, um, they seem to taste sweeter. Not for everyone here, it's sweeter with track one. Um, it, tasted, it tasted different. Uh, and this we've been working on now for, for almost a decade, the sonic seasoning. We have music uh, to bring out sweetness, to bring out bitterness. We have music for sourness. We have music for creaminess. We've been working in Nashville, Tennessee with a chef there, uh, Deb Paquet from Restaurant Etch. And we've got music, spicy music that will bring out the chili in a uh, spicy mango salad. Um, and this is kind of Incredible. where a lot of our uh, uh, 
uh, experience. A lot of our research is working then kind of taking the science and these sort of soundscapes have been, um, but no, you're not necessarily strange answering the chat question. It may be that there are cross-cultural differences, possibly. Uh, we don't know about that for sure yet. And there is sort of no quite right answer, but just that for the majority of people, the taste changes sort of an exciting area. And this is sort of, sort of magical that you can season food through music. It's also surprising uh, and it's a really fun collaboration then between uh, the creatives of the kitchen, uh, the mixologists, even the fermenters, I guess there must be a music of fermentation, um, uh, the baristas, the cocktail makers in London, but increasingly elsewhere in the world, working together with the sound designers, the audio branders, the composers, the DJs, uh, to find the perfect musical match for whatever it might be you're tasting, uh, to illustrate the science of gastrophysics along the way. Uh, and possibly, potentially, to nudge us all towards a healthier food future by adding sweetness without calories. Uh, and that you mentioned Amazing. at the very beginning, sorry, in the COVID era, that I think there's even a, an angle on um, sonic seasoning there, because we're, we've just been analysing a lot of the chefs in London and again elsewhere, who during COVID, who've been delivering meal kits to diners so you can enjoy a, a gastronomic treat at home. Um, and those, some chefs like Chef Joseph, and others um, who you know who deliver a multi-sensory experience in the restaurant. How do you deliver that in a meal box? It's kind of a challenge if you've got to prepare it at home uh, with your friends or family. Uh, but Chef Joseph, for one, now very frequently will send out a Spotify playlist of music designed to match uh, the food because he knows just how important what we hear is to what we taste. Great, and I will send out a. Professor Spence has given me a a SoundCloud library of, of more bitter, salty, sweet sounds to share with you all. Um, just very quickly, I, oh, I wanted to add British Airways has also got a sonic uh, menu yep. based on your research. Yeah, yeah. For long and fin, uh, uh, and uh, Finnair also had, um, they, they incorporated the sounds of nature where the chef supposedly got the ingredients that appeared on your plate in their long haul flights to Asia uh, as well. So it's sort of uh, picking up steam. Yeah, and just to uh, just very quickly, what are some other astrophysics principles we can introduce at home to improve our culinary experience? Uh, for me, the simplest thing is uh, heavy cutlery. Uh, that just makes things taste better, more expensive. So that's very pretty uh, easy. Um, and a very simple thing is a lot of our recent research from um, food festivals and expos around the world has been looking at the more you like the music you listen to, then the more you'll like whatever you're tasting as well. So perhaps one of the simplest things to do to improve the taste of the food is to make sure that you, you like the music that you put on at mealtimes. Fantastic. And, and just one very last question that I know everyone is um, dying to know, does a Bloody Mary really taste better on an airplane? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, strange but true that there is a quarter of the population who fly who uh, will order a Bloody Mary or tomato juice in the air, but never think of ordering one on the ground. That's kind of strange. Why would we people do that? Um, and it turns out that in airplanes, the noise of the engines is about 80 to 85 decibels. Um, and that noise suppresses our ability to taste sweetness and saltiness in food in the air, which is why the airlines have to put, you know, 30% more salt into the dishes to make them taste normal to you or I. But what that airline noise also does is actually enhances the taste of umami, the mysterious uh, protonaceous fifth taste. Um, and it is uh, umami that is a key component of tomatoes, explaining why they're not in a fruit salad. Um, and also of Worcester sauce, goes into your sort of perfect Bloody Mary. So it's almost as if people are self-medicating when they fly by choosing a drink, a Bloody Mary, that has a double umami hit that will stand up to the noise uh, of flight and taste better there than it does on the ground. Perhaps explaining why so many of us order it there and nowhere else. Strange but true. Fantastic, <laughs> that's fantastic. And um, to find out what, what wine pairing works best on the airplane, you'll have to actually get Professor Spencer's book and, and read it because he has, he has given us a wine pairing in there. 
Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of dreaming at the moment of, I guess, a cafe, um, a restaurant um, run by Inesh uh, with, with um, you know, fabrics done by Cavern and, and sonic seasoning and other gastrophysics principles um, uh, involved from Professor Spence. Uh, thank you so much to, to you all for the generous gift of your time and expertise today. Um, a very big thank you to Steph, Nana, and, and Simeon behind the scenes. Uh, biggest thanks of the night to all of you all for tuning in. Um, we'll be back not in June, but in July uh, for Cape Town on a Plate. We're going to the mother city. And we'll also be celebrating one year of Cities on a Plate. So check your email, spam, promotions tab um, by Wednesday for an exclusive invite to Cape Town. And keep up with us on social media. Um, in that newsletter, I'll also send out all these uh, great links of ways we can keep connecting with Inesh, Kevin, and keep up with Professor Spencer's um, uh, work and, and read his book. Um, so keep safe and uh, take care of yourselves, and we'll see you on July 25th. Thank you, everyone. Bye.